thank you all for attending. Um, uh, it's great to see so many people interested in this topic. Um, so let's start with an agenda, right? First thing I always like to know when I'm attending one of these is who is this guy and why should I listen to him? So we'll talk about that. Uh, then we're going to make some, some general sort of meta observations on exposure management. We'll talk about the attacker's mindset in particular. Uh, then we'll hit our deadly defaults. I apologize. I don't have an ominous uh, you know, music stab here to throw at you, but you'll have to pretend. And then at the end, we have free giveaways. And just to spoil the surprise, uh, free giveaways are just advice. I don't actually have things to send you. So, um, so let's get started. Uh, who is this guy? My name is Michael Belton. I've been doing information security for over 25 years now. Uh, I started, uh, actually, my wife and I started a dial-up ISP um, back in the mid-90s. We sold that. Uh, I went into a military environment where I taught offensive and defensive cyber. Uh, I've done a lot of consulting, uh, a company that was eventually bought by CDW. Uh, I was a global penetration testing manager at Rapid7 for several years. I worked in their R&D side. I was also a VP of R&D at Optive, uh, where I had a vulnerability research team and an applied research team operating under me. I've taught at a technical college. I've had my own businesses. Um, and uh, in general, I've been doing this for quite a while. So why does that matter? It matters for a variety of reasons to me. Um, first off, I have a lot of experience working with clients at all levels of maturity, security maturity in particular, right? How formalized are your operations, your security operations? How effective are they? A lot of those questions. So I've seen a lot from the very top of the heap uh, down to very small businesses. Um, and, and that's really given me, I think, a, a strong perspective of not only risk and risk management, but also the fiscal constraints involved with securing your business, uh, securing your networks and your devices. So um uh, so I, I, I try to bring practical knowledge to all of my talks. I don't like to talk very academically or theoretically. I like to to bring you know real world experience and guidance to these conversations. And then last bullet, I'm a I'm a pretty lousy golfer. So so uh, since I originally gave this talk at Black Hat, uh, Black Hat, I decided to leave this slide in here. Um, obviously, we're not at Black Hat, but uh, my my first Black Hat was Black Hat Two. My first DEF CON was DEF CON Six, and so uh, just a little bit of time travel around those uh, you know around those periods, right? We had a variety of big hits that happened. We had the Back Orifice release from uh, Cult of the Dead Cow. Um, that was 1997, if I remember correctly. Uh, we had um, the uh, uh, Mike Lynn uh, disclosure, the iOS HTTP authentication vuln. Um, we had the fake ATM at uh, at DEF CON. Uh, and so if you don't, uh, if you're not familiar with these, I'll just briefly describe them. The back office vulnerability was really, it was a set of tools, uh, a capability to really uh, exploit a lot of default Windows configurations. Uh, involving the SMB protocol and and some other tricks. So keeping with the theme of the talk, this is a great example of a default configuration and how a tool was uh, created to, um, to to really maximize the impact of an attack using those techniques. Uh, the iOS HTTP authentication vuln, if you're not familiar with that, uh, this is Cisco's iOS, not uh, Apple's iOS. So uh, in Cisco, there was for a time in their web-based management interface, if you had that uh, configured and turned on, there was a bug where with just a URL, right, just a web browser, you can make a request and specify that you wanted the command uh, you're sending to be executed with level 15 privileges, and it would happily execute that without authentication. If you're not familiar with Cisco devices, level 15 is effectively root. It's the highest level of privilege in the device. And so basically, we're talking about completely authenticated remote command execution uh, as a valid user using a uh, default installation of the product. And then finally, the ATM uh, example, I think, is compelling and interesting because, again, if you're not familiar with this, at DEF CON one year, uh, someone or someones uh, brought a fake ATM into uh, the hotel and just put it in a very high visibility location. And if I remember correctly, it sat there for over 24 hours. Um, I honestly don't remember the exact time frame, but um, 
uh, it was long enough that you know it was able it was able to capture a lot of you know a lot of people used it so potentially captured a lot of card information. I don't know that it was ever really disclosed in much detail as to what all would have been gathered, but um, but it was an active fake ATM that was exposed to the general public. And so again, the default here is sort of your default acceptance of the idea that hey, there's a machine, it looks legit. It's on the casino floor or it's in the hotel or wherever it is. I trust it, right? And so, again, that's a different type of exploitation of your defaults, but it's a valid one. And I think it's worth consideration and it's certainly worth uh, discussion in lulls, if nothing else. So, all right. So let's let's uh, just build on that a little bit. Uh, done with our time traveling and uh, let's talk about exposure management. So... The basic takeaway from this slide is that your attack surface is sort of this amorphous blob, right? It involves a lot of different things involving network services, the people who, you know, the humans who are running the machines, sort of your social engineering targets, um, you know, specific access controls to facilities and, uh, you know, network access and all of those good things. Um, if you still have data centers, which I know many still do, or if you still run server rooms, uh, those are a point of... Um, of attack. Cloud obviously is an attack surface in and of itself. And so when you think about the general attack surface that you're trying to protect as a practitioner, or if you're a red teamer that you're trying to, you know, to, um, uh, to test, then the attack surface is really this sort of amorphous blob, as I said before, right? There's a lot of moving pieces. There's a lot of different levels of exposure with, um, with sort of melting uh, um, network borders, we're really in a world now where uh, if you bring, for example, if you run a network where partners have VPN access into your network, right, your attack surface literally extends out now to the, the effectiveness of these partners. And, uh, and in that way, the idea of what's internal and what's external has really become a blurry line. Clearly there's some defined boundaries that we can point to. But in general, if you really step back and think about it, um, the idea of what's internal and what's external, especially in large, well-connected networks, um, becomes very blurry. I worked for an organization once, just as an example, I worked for an organization once that had a small office in the Supreme Court building and they had printers there, right? And so, and that was accessible from their production network. So in essence, if you think about the attack surface of the Supreme US Supreme Court, uh, it involved that partner's connectivity into there. Obviously a well-defended network, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just suggesting that that's a great example of one critical network and a second critical network combined through some sort of VPN or trusted connection. And where exactly is our border at that point? Right, so exposure management is really about understanding your attack surface. And then beyond that, as we'll talk about, sort of validating what that attack surface is able to do as far as a defensive posture is concerned. But the takeaway here is that attackers love attack surfaces. So to my red teamers on this call, uh, this is the thing that you're trying to, to test. And to my blue teamers on the call, this is the thing you're trying to defend. And uh, uh, I have great respect for those who are defending these things because this is not an easy job. So that leads me to the point, exposure does not equal vulnerabilities, right? So just because something's exposed, it doesn't necessarily mean that it has a vulnerability or that it's attackable, right? Uh, it may be well defended, defense in depth and all of those uh, concepts come into play here. So just a very quick hit on this slide, just to point out the idea that there's a difference between exposure and vulnerabilities, and we're gonna dig into that a little more. So at this point, I just wanted to talk about a, um, a security gap survey, right? We called it the External Attack Surface Exposure Survey that Pantera did. Um, this is 2022, 2023 data. And, um, and one of the, the most interesting takeaways here is that the um, the number of CVEs, right? The number of known vulnerabilities that can be exploited in an external attack surface is really very small. Um, and, and we'll talk about why that is in a bit, but in general, I'm sure you can guess, the reason is everybody patches external stuff pretty quickly. We're trained to do that. We've been trained to do that now for you know 30 years, 40 years. So, uh, so that's kind of a solved problem in many ways. 
But on the right hand side of the slide here, you'll see that there's a certain theme going on here, largely related to web uh, web facing applications or public facing applications, right? So cross-site scripting, exposed databases, SQL injection, local file inclusion, remote connections. This is a comp these are a combination of web application vulnerabilities and general infrastructure uh, connectivity concerns, right? Remote connections, exposed databases, those are infrastructure problems. Um, we're overexposing a port, for example, or we have a jump box that's exposed to the public internet and it's running some vulnerable thing. Um, the others listed here, cross-site scripting, SQL injection, LFI, those are web-based application issues. And so this really, uh, again, think about your attack surface, this extends your attack surface now out into the capabilities of your development team. These are effectively programmatic errors introduced into your environment by whoever developed these web applications and deployed them. And um, the, the takeaway is whether it's a remote connection that I'm exploiting or whether it's a SQL injection that I'm exploiting, the ultimate outcome from a red team perspective is probably very similar. Um, uh, a quick story from my past. So I, I'm, I've always been a red teamer. I, I, I love offensive security. I really believe in it as a tool for validating your, um, your defense posture and your capabilities. And, uh, and so I was doing an engagement with a team that I was on and we found a blind SQL injection in a web application. Uh, we were able to exploit that and um, convert the, uh, the requests in to a SQL query that actually ended up in initiating pings to validate that we had connectivity. And then effectively we took the SQL query, generated a host name using sensitive data that we were trying to exfiltrate and then had it look up against the domain we controlled. So literally exfiltration was just watching the web, the DNS server logs on our side and waiting for these host names to come through and the host names contain the payload of sensitive data we were looking for. So that's whether I have command line access to your machine or SQL injection, right? The impact can be very similar as the takeaway here. And uh, this survey may be, may be eye-opening to you, maybe um, a lot of people nodding their heads saying, yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> um, another thing that I want to talk about is just credential exposure, right? We have um, the Combs database, the combination of multiple breaches database. Um, th there are a variety of sites out, th out there that even take it to the next level, right? Have more breach data. And so the point is uh, there's a lot of breach data out on the internet already. And that breach data includes credentials, some of them valid, many of them not. But this really touches on a couple of things. First off, there's an exposure related to something that you had nothing to do with, right? LinkedIn gets popped and all of this information now is out on some site and that's not your cause, right? That's not an issue with anything you did, but now you discover that the data in there as it applies to your user base uh, is still being used, meaning the users are reusing those passwords that were disclosed and they're in your environment now and so now as an adversary, all I have to really think about is what does your username scheme look like? It's almost always guessable. And so now I have a potential for a, um, um, a password spraying attack or, um, or some other thing that involves authentication where I can combine these guest usernames and these passwords. So again, the, the takeaway from this slide is really the idea that these stolen credentials um, and um, are, are potentially, if you look at the, the graph on the right-hand side, the, the use of stolen credentials potentially has more impact than the uh, exploitable vulnerabilities in, uh, in an external environment. So let's talk about exposure management now, right? The thing that attackers hate. Uh, we hate competent exposure management. We hate when you understand your boundaries and you're thinking about your total defense posture of those boundaries and those sorts of things. Um, it makes our life very difficult. Fortunately, there's always a little something there. You can always rely on the users to do something silly or you know, there's a variety of, of other potential paths, but the more that you reduce these things that we've just discussed, um, across your uh, attack surface, the worst day uh, us red teamers are going to have. So, um, and so this really, uh, again, if you look at the, the graph on the right-hand side or the image on the right-hand side, it boils down to a variety of potential issues relating to vulnerabilities, which we discussed, default configurations, which is the point of this talk, 
And then credentials management and credentials exposure across the attack surface. Those three elements very, very broadly uh, define your exposure management capability. So one thing I wanted to dive into is, uh, is perhaps a bunch of common sense, but it's worth repeating, which is the idea that defenders are basically trained to think in lists. My blue team friends are, are really focused on these um, check checkboxes and and they have defined procedures and defined lists of configurations that they need to, to uh, deploy. And that's all well and good. Attackers, they kind of think in graphs, right? So the attackers have the advantage because they know what the checklists are, right? They know the standards. They know uh, all of the organizing bodies, whether it's NIST or ISO. And, and so they're well-versed in that, just like you as a blue teamer. Um, uh, the, the difference is they're able to just ignore that or think outside the box around that. So um, so this is my defenders thinks in, thinks, think in lists, easy for me to say, uh, slide. Oh, I had an ISO logo on here. I guess it fell off, but uh, I, I don't want to exclude my friends at ISO. But, you know, uh, here uh, NIST is a very uh, influential organization setting standards that are largely adopted globally. Uh, if not a whole cloth, at least in part. And ISO 27001, for example, another global standard th that really, when you examine it, has a strong roots in the NIST guidance. So, so we're inundated with these documents from these, uh, you know, from these standards bodies uh, and a as a blue teamer. And so they're defining, oh, uh, how do you deal with vulnerabilities? And what do you need to define for configurations? Uh, if you've ever heard of a STIG, a St Secured Technical Implementation Guide, which is used in military environments, very, very organized, very detailed, applies to pretty much everything that you can think of under the sun. Um, and, um, uh, and is used by defenders, right? So we have these tools, uh, we're trained to use these tools, uh, and the tools are quite frankly, quite capable. Um, where we run into issues is that sometimes the technology or sometimes the humans don't always apply these rules equally. And that's when we start to get some gaps. So we're thinking in lists, but there's a lot of potential for failure there in actually using those lists or deploying that um, in a consistent and repeatable way. And so attackers think in graphs, right? When I'm doing a red team operation, I, I'm well versed in all of the standards bodies and all of the, the guiding documents that they produce. Um, I, I've never really spent time being a blue teamer, but I understand blue team operations intimately, right? And, and so as an adversary or as an attacker, I'm thinking about, um, okay, I know that these are uh, the things that have to happen. So I don't have to waste my time. I'm going to poke lightly just to make sure that everybody's done their due diligence, but I'm going to think of, about the problem differently. So I'm going to think about MFA exhaustion attacks or things like that, right, to get a foothold. And, and a lot of those attacks are still completely and totally viable in today's environment. So even where you've hit every nail on the head perfectly from a defensive posture perspective, there are still issues related to again, these sort of melting borders and the fact that there's other technology providers now in the mix governing your security controls that I can take advantage of as a red teamer or an adversary. So we're thinking that way, right? We're not looking at, oh, I can't get to port 22, so I guess I can just you know, go have lunch. They've stopped me. No, the whole, the whole point of a red teamer is to think very differently about these things. So, um, so this, uh, I took this picture at Black Hat. This was the day's agenda. And uh, uh, personally, probably a bizarre sense of humor, but I thought it was interesting that basically all of these talks are attackers thinking in graphs presented as a list uh, with the, the idea that a lot of the people, if not most of the people at Black Hat are on the blue team and they're there to learn about this thinking in graph idea. Uh, so here's thinking in graphs as a list. All right, so um, posture context matters, right? U ultimately, that's where we're moving to as far as uh, what I said about MFA exhaustion or whatever whatever else is happening. So we have uh, we have two things here on this screen. We have a vulnerability, right? The ladder 
can't reach the vulnerability. And then we have the exploitable vulnerability. And we really only care about the exploitable vulnerabilities. Uh, I've met with very large companies and, and had this discussion. And there's uh, it, it's sort of obvious once you say it. But again, when you're thinking in lists, sometimes you get very focused on the list. And you get less focused on the idea that that as long as we're executing well in our defense in depth strategy using our lists, we can actually have vulnerabilities in our environment and feel comfortable about the fact that they're there. A great example is a company I just spoke with a couple of weeks ago, very large organization. Um, they know they have vulnerabilities internally, um, but their defense in, defense in depth posture means that they don't have to be concerned about it as far as like an incident response or an immediate patching. They don't have to request a, uh, you know, an emergency change request so that they can apply a patch because they're doing uh, validation through offensive security, right? They have their own red team and they're validating that, okay, if an adversary is in this position on the network, that vulnerability is completely unreasonable and unreachable. You have to have gotten access to this part of the network for it to actually become a risk or a real threat. And um, that's the point of this slide, right? Thinking about the idea that that an exploitable vulnerability is really the thing that we care about the most from a defense perspective. And identifying those and validating that they're actually real is the whole point of red teaming and offensive security in general. Um, it's not just an opportunity for us to write reports and you know drop them on people's desks. It's about really helping an organization be more secure by validating and proving that the thing that we believe can happen can actually happen. Um, you know, this is a proof of concept in the red team world. That's our guiding light is uh, let's create proof of concepts and let's demonstrate risk. And that's what this slide is really capturing mostly. So let's switch gears a little bit. We'll talk about common defaults from the field. Uh, I'm going to touch on a few different categories of defaults. I'm not going to, I have fairly text dense slides coming up. Uh, I'm not going to discuss all of them in depth, uh, but we'll, uh, we'll hit the highlights here. So uh, just to start off on the right-hand side, uh, this is actually a picture that I took of my TRS-80 Model 100. If you're not familiar, this was a laptop back in the day. You can see it has a uh, eight, eight line uh, screen there. You have a, uh, a, a cassette deck that attaches to it, an acoustic coupler. Anyways, the point is default passwords is like, a that's a really old problem, right? Starting back to the first Unix systems and before that even. Um, so, so I just say, let's hack the planet like it's 1997, because that's kind of what, to me, that's an inflection point, meaning, uh, default passwords and the number of people who could exploit default passwords kind of intersected, right? And it became a real actual problem, uh, globally in that, um, you know, cable modems and all of these things that were now becoming exposed. Uh, we're still using that trusted sort of old mentality of default passwords and the uh, people on the internet, right? The wonderful individuals that make up the interwebs uh, started to understand it and the tools became available to, to make it uh, very simple for anyone, regardless of skill level, to start to exploit these things. So, so this is an everything old is new again kind of problem, right? We seem to recycle these problems all the time when IoT became a big thing again. Uh, many years ago, all of a sudden here we are back again with all of these tiny cheap devices with default creds and easily exploitable conditions related to that. So this is definitely, a, we recycle our problems in InfoSec and, and enjoy doing it, it seems. So um, that said, the vendors have gotten better with this issue, right? Vendors have improved their postures. They have improved upon their processes. You got to think about it from their perspective. I mean, it's difficult to have a manufacturing, let's say we're making some IoT widget. It's difficult to set up a manufacturing process where you ensure that every device has um, uh, a unique password even, let alone a, a unique username and password. And how do you communicate that to the user, right? Sticker on the device or something like that. It's a challenging problem. So I'm, I'm not throwing shade on any particular area here, I'm just suggesting that, that these are problems that keep recycling. So, um, so hack all the things, right? We got IoT, we have printers with defaults, databases, applications, network devices, backup systems, security devices, sh shared passwords, right? 
uh, trust relationships between user accounts is what I'm talking about there. So um, uh, one story uh, involving printers, uh, default passwords on a printer. Um, I've had a lot of success over the years as a red teamer, just getting access to printers, using that to get LDAP access to address books and things like that, right? That's a foothold into your Active Directory environment, and then just expanding out on that in a variety of ways. So, so again, default passwords here are a thing. Everybody knows about the thing, um, but uh, but it's still a thing. So we need to uh, we need to be thinking about that. So that's um, that is definitely one of the deadly defaults. Default passwords are a terrible thing, um, and not changing them is uh, is neglig uh, negligent, in my opinion. Next up, we have default configurations. So on the right hand side here, I just did a quick search for. Uh, for um, vulnerabilities that included the word default, and those are highlighted in pink. And you can see here, we've got um, a variety of targets. We have JBoss from Red Hat. We have uh, uh, Microsoft uh, Input Method Editor, the Japanese version. Uh, we have iOS from Cisco. Uh, all of these involve default configurations that are exploitable conditions. And they're all from uh, 2022. So I'm not digging back to 1997 for this. This is 2022. We're still seeing these things, right? Default configurations, default deployment models have an impact on your security. Um, again, going back to the checklist, that's why we have them. That's what STIGs are for, et cetera. So this is a challenging issue, right? You can't be expected, especially until the vulnerability is disclosed, you have to put a certain degree of trust in your vendors and deploy them as they recommend, right? Whatever the product is. So it's a challenging issue, but it does extend to a lot of different, <clears throat> excuse me, configurations, whether it's your directory services, um, uh, either an active directory environment or in a pure Unix Kerberos environment or whatever you're doing, right? Directory services and the defaults are a potential blind spot. Um, default users, default group privileges, things like that. Um, default cloud management configurations. And, uh, and in particular, uh, for those of you living in a DevOps world, the, um, the idea of using uh, images, machine images that are just supplied to you uh, through a vendor or, or, um, you know, or, or through some third party that you're working with, right? You're presuming that those are configured to your standards perhaps, and perhaps they're not. Um, EDR configuration issues. So maybe you have a, a large EDR deployment, and um, and you know you have a thousand machines, and 998 of them EDR is deployed flawlessly, but two of them it isn't, right? The two are the ones again thinking in graph. The two are the ones that the adversary is going to uh, have the most fun with, and they're they're motivated and determined to find them. So um, presuming that things are deployed. Uh, uh, is a uh, you know a bad presumption. Um, group policy deployment, right? In a pure Windows Active Directory environment, doesn't always work properly. It doesn't always make the endpoint through connectivity issues or some other thing. Um, and uh, and here again, we as uh, as blue teamers, you're sort of thinking, well, I I made this change in Active Directory. I pushed it out. It's working, right? So um, again, red team. Uh, offensive security validation, whatever you want to call it, that um, that work is really critical here for for validating what we're talking about. Um, network service configuration, so default out of the box with you know fifteen different network services running, two of them that you actually want or use. Uh, default desktop software defaults, so uh, web browser is a great example of this, right? Remote exploits through uh, hacking into the browser, right? Through a malicious site or some other thing. Uh, language interpreters, all that good stuff. Default configurations associated with all of these has an impact either on the network or the endpoint in a variety of interesting and fun ways. Uh, fun for a, a red teamer, at least. Default protocols, right? So many protocols to talk about, so little time to talk about them, but uh, let's just hit some of the big ones. So LLMNR, uh, server message block, multicast DNS in variety of forms, uh, all of the things that printers do, old versions of NetNTLM, Kerberos version four, WPAT attacks. Um, if you're not familiar with WPAT attack, I just kind of refer to the image on the right here. 
Uh, the idea is that we know, for example, that when you open a browser in most configurations um, on a win in a Windows network, it's going to make a request for the WPAD's uh, server. And WPAD is a way to remotely configure your browser. You can set rules and policies and all that, right? And so the classic attack has been around for a very long time is that the victim sends out this request for the WPAD server. It doesn't actually exist. I, as an adversary on your network, just say, oh, you want WPAD? That's cool, that's me. And then um, at that point, I can force an authentication process from your client, capture those credentials, relay them in real time, or depending on what I get, uh, perhaps take them offline for cracking. So that, that's sort of it in a nutshell. Um, it relies on a lot of these protocols that we're talking about here. Um, in my next slides, we'll go into it a little bit deeper. So here again, second verse, same as the first. What, what do we actually care about here? In this, um, in this image, uh, this is an image from our tool from uh, Pentera Core. And uh, here you can see the first achievement is that uh, we were able to force uh, a host to authenticate to our rogue server. And then through that, we were able to capture some credentials over HTTP. And you can see that the username was cleanup and the host that we received this data from is this IP address. At that point, um, we also have an achievement where we validated that the SMB server on our target does not validate the clients. And so because of that, we were able to perform a relay attack over LDAP. Uh, again, you can see the host that we attacked and the user that we used. And then at the very end here, because this was cleanup was a privileged user, it was a service account, we were able to create our own domain uh, admin user and, um, and we gave it a unique name and it's in this domain. Um, and so this is sort of a, a different way of viewing, at least from our product perspective, a different way of viewing this attack, um, which is really the nuts and bolts of what happened. What's happening in Pantera Core is we're automating all of that and we're just showing you the attack path. And so what matters most, right? This goes back to that we have a vulnerability and we have an exploitable vulnerability. And so the, the vulnerability ultimately is the host can be forced to authenticate to a rogue server, right? If we, can, if we can eliminate that issue, the rest of this goes away and we don't necessarily have to prioritize the idea that each of our endpoints doesn't validate the clients, right? So we're... We're going after the root cause. And from a defense and configuration perspective, we're buying ourselves time to maybe refresh the way we think about certain protocols or refresh the way we uh, uh, configure our golden images or push out, you know, depending on the size of your network, uh, push out a, uh, a large change to a variety of endpoints and then validate it afterwards. So that's... Um, uh, that's a great example of what I was talking about earlier, where you can have a vulnerability. If it's not exploitable, it's a condition that you need to resolve, but you've bought yourself time because you've eliminated the root cause, which is actually what makes it exploitable. All right, so let's talk about default procedures. I uh, put an image of a golden retriever on this slide, mainly because I, golden images are a thing and everybody loves looking at a dog while you're learning about InfoSec. So, so default procedures, this is a little bit of a different, <clears throat> excuse me, a little bit of a different beast. Sorry, I have to take a quick drink. In that your procedures for deploying new machines and configuring your networks and, and running their networks over time, um, your procedures potentially uh, become a, a, a component of an attack or a target of an attack, right? So structured naming conventions, your use of golden images, but the golden images aren't as secure as they could be. Um, help desk procedures. So resetting passwords through a help desk, those sorts of things can be manipulated by an adversary. Uh, key management practices. Um, and this extends way beyond Excuse me. Uh, this extends way beyond the idea of, oh, you have, you know, a thousand TLS certificates that are self-signed. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, although that's a component of it, but I'm talking about specifically, like, let's say we're doing key-based uh, authentication for SSH protocol, or let's say we're doing certificate-based authentication to web applications where we're storing the certificate locally on the endpoint, something like that, right? Your, your key management practices 
loss of the signing key or compromise of the signing key, those sorts of things come into play here. <clears throat> I apologize. So managed browser configurations, we kind of hit on this with the WPAD discussion, but it goes, it extends beyond that. Um, OS updating practices, wireless security product workflow. Uh, I'll just talk on that in a second or supply chain attacks, which everybody loves. Um, so wireless security product workflow. Uh, the reason I included this one uh, is that I did, uh, I was part of a team that did some research on this uh, many years ago. We published a paper on it, but um, the idea was we gathered a bunch of uh, wireless security products, the type that scan an environment, look for rogue APs, things like that. And then they present that data in a management interface. And so the paper is about using malicious SSIDs as an injection point into these products. And so what we did was um, we stood up a rogue AP, but the SSID that we used was malicious. It included, for example, a um, uh, some sort of injection technique um, and uh, uh, cross-site scripting perhaps, right? So we tried all of these things. And so what we found was um, in a lot of tools, you could stand up an access point with a malicious SSID. The tool sees that, consumes the SSID and brings it into the management interface. Once you look at it in the management interface, our attack payload is executed. Let's say it's cross-site scripting. And now we start to gain a foothold into your environment through the fact that you have this security appliance that's scanning SSIDs and we're sitting out in the parking lot being jerks. Um, so uh, again, uh, an, an interesting way that defaults or, um, or even just trust in certain things to be robust and secure can be misleading. Now, obviously few organizations have the capabilities to say to a vendor, um, you're not going to deploy your stuff into our environment until we've had it fully security tested. By the way, we also want to see your security test results, right? Not a lot of organizations have that level of clout. So um, so you are naturally put in a position to trust the things that you're buying. The whole point of that research was to demonstrate uh, interesting and new attacks against those um, uh, those uh, against those presumptions and uh, level of trust. So your exposure management, big takeaway here, your exposure management strategy is as good as your security validation capabilities. And again, I've said this a number of times now, but I'm a huge offensive guy. That's what gets my juices flowing. That's what I love to do. And security validation is a part of that, right? That's the whole point that we're doing offensive work. So let's talk about protocols. Um, each of the protocols listed here is actively abused by adversaries if they can get a foothold in your environment. Uh, so let's start disabling some of these things. Disable LLMNR. That's kind of a no-brainer, um, but it's amazing to me how many organizations are, aren't doing that. Uh, same with server message blocks, sort of one of the, the legacy, uh, but still foundational protocols used in uh, some Windows environments, right? Uh, multicast DNS in all of its various forms. Uh, IPv6 is a good one, right? Um, uh, in Microsoft, with uh, in a Windows, I'm sorry, not in Microsoft, in a Windows uh, workstation, um, there is a capability called Teredo. Teredo is uh, is is something that Microsoft deployed. Uh, Linux has a uh, comparable capability. But the idea was, as we start to adopt IPv6, um, we, it'd be really nice if we could run IPv6 on our internal networks for scaling, but we still have to deal with the IPv4 internet. And so because of that, let's set up an IPv6 to IPv, IPv4 gateway. And in practice, what this mean was, what this meant was, or means today, is you can enable the Teredo, um, uh, Sorry, I was just going over the chat. Uh, I'll touch on that in a second. But um, you know, you can use Teredo basically as a effectively a uh, command and control channel or a backdoor into a compromised network. So the idea is you compromise a workstation, you enable the Teredo interface, you set up an IPv6 to IPv4 tunnel. Um, that traffic actually flows through Microsoft's network, which made it really interesting back in the day. Um, because effectively then if I come back through this back channel, um, it looks like the traffic is coming from Microsoft, 
deceptively difficult. First off, that built-in trust. Um, obviously, your machines are communicating for updates and a variety of other things to Microsoft all the time. So it looks like relatively normal traffic unless you really take it apart and have strict uh, knowledge of what your network is supposed to be doing. Oh, um, and I guess, sorry, I, I'm just reminded I am a little bit over time. So I'll just uh, very quickly go through the rest of these. Uh, I'll hit the highlights here. Um, so let's talk about passwords. I think this is probably the, the next, I'll end on this really. Uh, passwords, hotly debated topic. I'll give you my perspective of it as someone who cracks passwords uh, as part of a red team type work. First off, password length is very important. Make your passwords as long as possible. So what does that mean? Let's talk about passphrases. Uh, when I taught in a military environment, I used to recommend pull a book off your shelf, go to your favorite chapter, take the first sentence, pop, uh, properly punctuated, that's your passphrase, right? Now, when you need to change it, grab a different book, grab the same book, whatever. But if you forget it, you know where to look. Uh, it's very straightforward to remember your password. And the reason length is important is it, it goes against the um, the the monetary trade-off that a cracker has to deal with, right? A longer password requires more computations to try to crack. And so it becomes a more expensive password to try and get access to. So length is more important, I would suggest, than diversity of characters. Um, I'd rather have a 32 character password with spaces in it and no capitalization or anything than a 12 character password that requires me to use at symbols and everything else. First off, it's easier to remember. Second off, the economics of cracking uh, mean that the longer one is more secure just, just by how cracking works. Password uh, rotation is pretty important. I put very important there. It's pretty important. If you accomplish the, the length, if you conquer the length issue, the rotation issue becomes less of a problem uh, uh, or priority, I should say. But uh, password uniqueness over time is very important, right? Think about that credentials exposure discussion we just had. If you're re reusing passwords over a short period of time, that just increases your likelihood of compromise. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of wrap it up here, but I'll just show the rest of these slides. Endpoint defense, if you wanted to take a screenshot, uh, endpoint defense is important. Here's some guidance there. Uh, here's network defense, some guidance, honey users, honey tokens, all that good stuff. Uh, your users, right? Layer eight, uh, always has been, they are a problem. So policies and communicating policies, governing them over time, testing your users, very important things. Um, this was conference hygiene. So this is really a black hat or any security conference specific slide, but remember you're going into the den of thieves if you go to a conference. So just keep that in mind. And then finally, uh, thank you very much for your time. I'm happy to take questions. Uh, and uh, this slide I'll leave up, but uh, here's a way you can request a demo of our products. Um, so one of the things I see in chat is uh, about the risk of leaving IPv6 in a default configuration. Uh, it, it re really, that's a complicated question, Corey. It's a good question. It's a complicated question because it really depends on that layers, those layers of defense. Ultimately, there's really nothing wrong with IPv6 in a default configuration for a variety of reasons, but it really depends on how far an adversary can get into your network and whether you're heavily using IPv6, right? Um, ultimately, the, the, you know, the default wisdom of if you're not using it, turn it off uh, applies here. But um, yeah, uh, Chris, that, that's exactly, if you're not using it, Turn it off. That that applies to everything, right? Reduce your attack surface as much as possible. You do that by disabling things you don't need. I'll also point out when it comes to disabling things like SMB or LLMNR, what I highly recommend is if you if you have to do it on the cheap, uh, you know, stand up a Proxmox machine, open source virtualization software, and you know, lab this up. And you can do that for, for really low impact and not a lot of money if you're resource constrained. Otherwise, you know, if you've got all the fun toys, uh, just rock and roll it. Any other questions? I'm happy to take them. I have my Q&A window open and my chat. I'm watching them both.
Oops, don't cover that up. Hey, thanks, Corey. You're the man. Ah, there's a link to the demo again in chat. Well, I thank you all for staying on so long. Um, I went over at Black Hat as well. I guess that's my thing now. So, um, um, uh, Jonathan says, we, when a user forgets their password or it needs to be reset, we default to a very standard unsafe password. We have no way of knowing if the user actually changed it. Yeah, I mean, that that's uh, <laughs> that's a very, very classic problem, right? That that goes, speaks to the help desk procedures and my knowledge of 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 your procedures as an adversary. Um, uh, unfortunately, right, the only thing you can do is in combination with giving out that password, let's say you're working the help desk, is to have the permissions to force the password to change it on next login. Other than that, um, the other thing you can do is run, um, so for example, with our product, you could do an, what we call an Active Directory password assessment, run that against your environment, uh, give it, you know, give the tool your password, um, your magic password that you give to everybody and see how many accounts still have it. That's the only other way to do, to, uh, to really recognize that problem or identify it. Yes, that's exactly, Vincent, exactly what I'm saying. Great questions, great discussion. And yeah, Hayden also hit on the same thing. Uh, the last part again, so it, it's in the comments as well, but there's there's two things, right? When, you, when you've changed that password, if you have permissions in Active Directory, you can check the box <clears throat> in the user profile to force them to change the password the next time they log in. So um, so that would that would help ensure that. And then the second part I said is uh, in Pentera Core, you can use our ADPA, Active Directory Password Assessment, you can feed the ADPA module your default password, right? The one that you always use for resets. And then you can uh, point it at your Active Directory environment and it will identify all of the users that still have that password uh, in use. And so that's another way to validate in a, in a repeatable, robust way um, over time, how many users are not changing that password. Thanks for sharing an hour of your day with me and uh, good luck out there, my friends. It's a rough one.